Okay, so as, uh, as Elizabeth said, I'm going to be talking about inequalities um, in well-being in later life. J just a couple of um, uh, comments before, before I start. Um, the first one is that I worked out um, that I think I've been a member of the Radical Statistics um, Society since um, Ludi tempted me in um, uh, back in 1998, so for, 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 for quite a long time. So thank you to Ludi Simpson for tempting me into this um, fold. I've not been a particularly active member, but I've been very pleased to, um, uh, to participate in discussion and to see the, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, journal, which is great, absolutely great. Um, a number of logos on, on my um, opening slide, and that reflects um, uh, largely that this is a collaborative piece of work. So there's a large number of people who, have, um, uh, who I've been able to work with in terms of um, generating this. And at the, in my last slide, I'll, I'll give a list of names which reflects most of them, though not all of them. Uh, and other logos reflect funders and my um, uh, institutional locations and so on. Uh, the key thing to say is that um, I'm in the Cathy Marsh Centre at the University of Manchester as well as um, in the sociology um, department. So I'm going to be talking about inequalities in well-being in later life and particularly focus on the question of socioeconomic um, uh, inequalities uh, and the drivers of those. And it, it, at, at a superficial level and probably at a real level, it doesn't really address the question of is Britain pulling apart because that's obviously a, a kind of active change that we're thinking about. But what I'm going to try and do is to remind us that, it, that, that inequalities are not about older people and younger people only or the advantages that the baby boomer generation might be taking at the expense of younger generations. It's also about inequalities within age groups and within generations, uh, and these are really quite stark, um, as um, was raised in, in, in uh, Claire's talk about gender inequalities as well. And so it's to focus on that. But the starting point is really to talk about ageing and why ageing is an important issue. And this is an old quote um, from 1999, the Global Commission on Aging. And the essence of this um, quote is that um, as with global warming, we're facing a terrible crisis in terms of the aging of populations. Uh, talked about in the same kind of ways as global warming uh, when you read reports in relation to this. So nothing is more likely to shape economic, social and political developments in the 21st century than the simultaneous aging of these three major um, developed world sites, but of course the ageing in the less developed world is equally um, striking and uh, conceived to be equally problematic. To preserve economic security we must adapt the social institutions built around it to these new realities and of course we've seen the ways in which many of these institutions have been adapted. Um, so extended working lives uh, and uh, real um, attacks on pension rights uh, over time. Um, but the second part of the quote, I think, is, is also really um, uh, interesting because it says, beneath the daunting fiscal projections lies a long-term economic, social and cultural dynamic. What it would be like to live in societies that are much older than any, we have, than any we have ever known or imagined. What will it be like? And of course, it's the what will it be like, which suggests to us not only is our society transforming, but the experience of ageing is transforming. And it's part of that, that uh, it's addressing that question in part that I want, to, um, uh, I want to go to in this talk as well. And I'll start with this. And this is a picture from our um, uh, local art gallery um, just around the corner from here, a Walter Sickert uh, picture. Um, I'm not a great consumer of art, but I do occasionally wander around art galleries. And on the stairwell, this picture was there, and it just struck me. And I've quoted from the card that went with it, with it to, uh, on the right-hand side of the picture uh, about how contemporary critics found the image shocking at a time when we thought the elderly should be treated with respect or represented with respect or with sentiment. And then the honesty and brutality that's in uh, Sickett's uh, picture uh, there. And, and what this reminds us, of course, is that what it is to be old, how we understand ageing, how we relate to older people, and how we as older people experience ageing changes over time, changes across context, changes in different cultures and over history. And so the kind of fears that we have about ageing societies, um, of course, reflect a perception of ageing that is fixed in a particular historical period, which may well be very different when these changes happen or as these changes happen. And so we have this notion of a third age, 
and um, uh, a third age where people are healthy, wealthy, and engaged in society, enjoying a post-retirement um, uh, life. So post-retirement, post-parenting, and before they're uh, dependent. Uh, and of course, this comes from uh, Laslett's uh, work. Uh, and something that we are in is increasingly visible in our society, representations of older people um, on holiday, uh, enjoying their money, enjoying their time, older people as consumers, the grey pound, and so on. And the notion that, it, it, or, or Laslett's notion was, was that these older people could contribute to, to society as well. So voluntary community activities, political, civic engagement, you've got time, you've got money, and you've got um, your health. And you can consume and enjoy life, leisure, pleasure, and so on. And importantly, in terms of the ways in which we think about older people in our society, moving towards the cultural ma mainstream, so shaping our society uh, in, in many ways as well. And then the notion of, um, uh, uh, of this period in which we can self-fulfill, um, connecting with Maslow's notions uh, of self-actualization, having a role, status, and having fun. But we have also seen in, the, in this period of austerity uh, a shift in um, discourse to, towards these third ages as, in fact, greedy, self-interested baby boomers. Uh, and so those are the people who've stolen, or we are the people, because I'm just at the tail end of that, we are the people who've stolen everyone else's futures. Um, because we have taken advantage of public sector uh, investments in uh, education, healthcare, and so on, uh, and made lots of money, uh, and now we're not willing to contribute back uh, to the system. The important point in these discussions, of course, and I've already implied that, this is, that I think this is an important point, the important point in these discussions is that you can't characterize baby boomers or older people as some uniform uh, group. Uh, there are in marked inequalities um, within that group, which I will go on to demonstrate. And the idea that the resources to enjoy this wonderful third age are strongly related to socioeconomic position. Uh, my argument, of course, is that class inequalities persist into retirement. And when we talk about baby boomers or when we talk about the third age, we actually need to focus on class uh, 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 as well. And I'll illustrate the point with this slide, and again, bringing the Manchester context um, here. Ma one of the great things about Manchester, there are quite a few great things about Manchester, but one of the great things about Manchester in the context of um, ageing is that the City Council is really committed to making Manchester an age-friendly city. Uh, so thinking about the ways in which the services it provides uh, can be adapted um, uh, to promote um, a positive life for older people in the city, but also thinking about uh, the question of poverty and class within the city. Uh, and what we see in, and I've already talked about the kind of pictures of older people enjoying, uh, enjoying holidays, but we also see this notion of frail, dependent elderly, pe uh, elderly people. Um, so that's a, a picture from a BBC website, quite old now, when the first discussions around um, extending working lives really hit home. Uh, uh, contrasted with a picture from a, um, a Manchester valuing older people um, brochure advertising one of the events that it's holding for um, older people. And the contrast is really quite stark and my argument is that when we see these images and we see these contrasting images of, um, of aging uh, in, in society, what in fact we are seeing are contrasting class images. They're not presented in that way. We have discussions about frailty, dependency and so on, and we have discussions about greedy ba baby boomers, but what they are are stereotypical um, uh, representations of the class experience of later life, is my argument. Okay, um, now this is, um, uh, believe it or not, a research paper, so I am gonna um, uh, now talk about some uh, research which illustrates the points that I've made in terms of um, introduction. As I said, the, I'm drawing on a couple of pieces of research, uh, and research that um, uh, I've been fortunate enough to conduct um, in collaboration with a, a relatively large group of colleagues. I want to ask some questions um, and, um, uh, and focus them around well-being and focus them around the experience of well-being in later life and how that might be shaped by socioeconomic position, class location, uh, and so on. And so the first question is, how is, uh, how is well-being patterned in later life? Uh, and we've seen, seen a literature which is beginning to argue that we have a classic U-shaped um, uh, experience of well, or inverted U-shaped experience of well-being. So as we move towards retirement and in the years post-retirement, well-being improves, and then we see a deterioration in well-being in later life. 
And so that then raises questions in terms of a cross-sectional de uh, description, how far this is an age cohort effect and how far this is an aging effect. Whether we see um, a, a third age effect within this U-shaped uh, distribution of well-being and how that relates to retirement and retirement experiences. Whether different dimensions of well-being behave in the same way. And then the kind of key questions, I think, are, are really why do we see this patterning of well-being um, with age, the patterning um, that I will show in a minute. What is it that drives the association between well-being and age? And how far is that related to um, socioeconomic position? So what evidence is there for class inequalities in later life characterized um, by the well-being outcomes? I'm going to use the English Longitudinal Study of Aging um, to do this. Uh, so for those of you who don't know the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, you can get the data from the UK um, Data Service uh, and um, a brief summary um, here. So it's a panel study of people aged 50 and over, as the um, words longitudinal and aging imply, and based in England. So drawn from the Health Survey for England, the sample initially. And we have six um, waves of data. I think the sixth wave of data is maybe a matter of days away from being deposited in the archive. Um, and an additional wave zero um, from the Health Survey for England data. People are interviewed every two years and they have a medical assessment every four years. We have proxy interviews for those people who can't do them. We have end of life interviews for those people who die um, during the panel. And of course, a reasonable, reasonable proportion of them do. And we have detailed content. And really exciting things about the English Longitudinal Study of uh, survey of ageing is, is that it's, um, it's an interdisciplinary study, maybe multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, in, in the sense that we have detailed content across a number of domains, so from the economics to the health to the social, uh, and I've given a brief summary of, of those. And the other really exciting thing about it is that it has partner studies in a number of different countries, so we can study the ageing experience in different economic, cultural contexts. And I've listed a few there. HRS in the US, SHARE across mainland Europe, CLOSER in Korea, and Charles in China. Well-being, uh, and I'll just very briefly talk through how we as a research team are conceptualizing well-being and how we're setting about measuring it uh, within um, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. And, and part of the conception is that there are different dimensions of, uh, of well-being, and the classic distinction is between hedonic and eudaimonic um, uh, well-being. With hedonic well-being, kind of the classic maximization of um, uh, pleasure and minimization of suffering. Suffering, and I've got the picture on the right, which my colleague Bram Van Hoot got. In fact, the two pictures on the oh, sorry on the left, <laughs> the two pictures on the left are from a much larger picture where you can see these characters um, uh, uh, together. And so that's the, the ones at the top there are Aristippus and um, Epicurus, and at the bottom is um, Aristotle. And um, yeah, so about pleasure, and you can measure pleasure um, in, in two dimensions, affective dimensions uh, and cognitive dimensions. And within ELSA, we've operationalized this um, with a, a measure of negative affect, uh, the CESD depression symptoms score, and evaluation of life, the DINA satisfaction with life um, uh, measure. And then eudaimonic well-being, which is really about self-fulfillment, realizing one's potential, and I've got Maslow's um, hierarchy on the right there. Uh, and we've operationalized this using the CASP, which was designed particularly to measure quality of life um, uh, for older people. And contains, contains dimensions of control in, over one's life, autonomy over one's life, self-realization, and pleasure. Um, we've done a lot of work around measurements, um, uh, 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 the measurement properties of these scales. Uh, but in the end, what I've done is use a truncated version of the CASP scale uh, and the full versions of the CSD and DINA. Um, life satisfaction scale. And what I'm going to do with them is to observe um, uh, changes in well-being both across age cohorts and as individuals age. And to do that, um, we've used longitudinal multi-level growth models where individuals are, are at level two and the observations of each individual is at um, uh, level one. And the really nice thing about this in terms of design, of course, is that if we group people into reasonably small um, uh, age bands and we can see overlapping age cohorts and see differences over, over time or across cohorts um, in terms of outcomes. I won't talk about that a great deal for this um, uh, uh, session. 
And I'm going to model the association between well-being and both age and age cohort. So ageing and age cohort with adjustment for a range of covariates and show the impact of these covariates on, on, on the um, relationship between age and age cohort and um, well-being. And they're obvious things, controlling for demographic factors. Look what happens when people's marital status change, uh, when their socioeconomic position changes, when their health changes, and when their social support um, changes. And on the whole, we're observing people over eight years for this. So I'm using five waves of the English longitudinal uh, study of ageing, and I'm going to do some socioeconomic work, so socioeconomics in the models, but also stratifying the models um, by um, socioeconomic position using wealth as the measure. OK, I think I've, I think I've said that about um, background, and I'm going to try and show you some uh, findings now. And so this is the relationship between age, in effect age cohort, and negative affect. So um, CSD, depression symptoms, and the higher up you are on that scale, the worse your um, level of um, depression symptomatology. And what you can see is the reduction in depression symptomatology up until uh, probably just before the age of 70, 68, something like that, and then the rise um, in later life. And so that's kind of a, a, a prima facie case for um, that period in middle life where your well-being um, improves, third age perhaps, and so on. This is cognitive well-being, so the life satisfaction with life scale, how happy are you with your life as it stands. And the higher up you are on this, the higher your level of um, uh, satisfaction. And you can see a similar effect. Um, so as you move towards your... Uh, mid 60s, early, well, yeah, mid, mid to late 60s, your satisfaction with life improves and then it deteriorates uh, subsequently. Um, for those of us who are on the kind of left hand side of this chart, it's pretty good, isn't it? You can see the improvements over, uh, over time. Uh, so I'm looking forward to in, in, in improvements over the next 10 years or so. Um, uh, and then this is quality of life. So this is the eudaimonic uh, self-realization um, uh, type uh, measure. And interestingly, what this shows, in contrast to the others, is no improvement. A fairly um, flat part for the first um, five years or 10 years uh, of, of, of the age periods that I'm covering, and then the deterioration uh, over time. So having shown that broad pattern of variation across age cohorts, uh, I now want to try and set about it explaining this and then also examining how aging, how individual people aging over time might be patterned as well in terms of their well-being. So first off to start explaining it, and I'm going to use the depression measure just, to, just for speed and um, uh, in ease, but also because it's a very nice illustration of this inverted U shape um, uh, that you, you can see. And the really interesting thing for me to examine first, well, there are two things to examine. One, one is this improvement in well-being. Uh, and the other is the deterioration in, in later life. And the first thing I want to examine is the improvement in well-being. And to just focus on a specific event that um, occurs around these ages, which is that of retirement. And so how does um, uh, retirement uh, impact on our well-being? But I don't want to treat retirement as a discrete event, a uniform event experienced by people in un fairly uniform ways. And that's for obvious reasons, of course. My interest is in inequality uh, and class. And so I want to think about different types of retirement and different contexts of retirement. And I'm going to do that in two ways. Um, so in this model that I'm about to show you, I'm going to model transitions into retirement and compare those who retire with those who are still working. And I want to stratify the analysis to look at differences according to wealth on retirement. Uh, and so I'm going to have three wealth groups uh, and show differences in their retirement outcomes in terms of well-being and route into retirement, and characterize route into retirement in, 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 as three types. Routine retirement, when people reach retirement age. Voluntary, and so when people say they've retired for these kinds of reasons, they want to enjoy life, they want to spend time with their partner or family, wanted to change, wanted to give the younger generation a chance, and importantly offered reasonable financial terms to retire early. Some of the people that we've studied, of course, uh, did experience this in the 1980s and 1990s, not something uh, we're likely to experience in the near future. Uh, anymore. And then contrast that with involuntary retirees, so people are made redundant, whose health has forced them out of work, who can't find a job. And I'll show both wealth and retirement in the same uh, model. So on the left, uh, on the, in the same chart, sorry. 
And on the left-hand side is route into retirement, on the right-hand side, wealth on retirement. And the model simply shows change in your depression score over the retirement transition compared with people who stay uh, in work. And so change, if it goes up, then your depression is getting worse. And if it goes down, your depression is getting better. And you can see I put um, confidence intervals from the model in this. What you can see is that people who are retiring voluntarily, compared with people who stay in work, have a, a worsening of their depression symptoms. And people who retire through the routine route have the same kind of change in their depression symptoms as those who continue working. And people who retire voluntarily, there's a suggestion of an improvement in their well-being, just a suggestion of their improvement in their well-being compared with those who stay in work. And then the three categories of wealth that uh, I've shown here, uh, and you can see that the poorest retirees compared with those who stay in work have a deterioration in their depression score, and the richest retirees compared with those who stay in work have an improvement in their depression score. So the on average effect of retirement is zero in terms of well-being, but what we see is that to contrast that, that average of zero is a result of contrasting experiences of retirement. Some people are able to get the benefits from retirement and others are not. And of course, if you look at who is forced into involuntary retirement and who takes voluntary retirement, that correlates quite strongly with the wealth marker or with other markers of class, uh, occupational position. Okay, I want to turn now to focus on the, uh, so, so I haven't said, in fact, retirement doesn't explain that improvement um, in, in well-being. Um, sorry, I should have said that um, uh, um, uh, uh, as I was talking about the zero effect um, on average of retirement. So retirement doesn't explain that improvement, and of course retirement doesn't relate to the deterioration uh, in later life. And so I want to now talk about those, uh, to try and deal with that pattern and try and explain that pattern. And I'm going to do that just by sh simply showing you the change in the shape of this line as we put control variables into it. So at the moment, or explanatory variables into it. So at the moment, I've only got gender and ethnicity um, in, in, the, in, in the model. If I put marital status in the model, then the improvement still happens, but the deterioration is much shallower. And what this tells us, of course, is that much of the deterioration in later life is a consequence of losing one's spouse. So one's husband or wife or partner dies. The next thing I put in the model is socioeconomic position. And what you see there is that it doesn't change the shape of the line at all. Um, which, of course, is a consequence of actually there not being very marked differences in economic uh, position uh, across there apart from retirement. So the other things that we measure, occupational class is obviously historic, education, also historic and wealth, actually doesn't shift hugely um, uh, across those age bands. And the retirement effect, effect, as I showed you, is on average neutral. Next, I put in health. And then you get a very positive um, picture of the association between well-being and age. Uh, improvement across cohorts um, once you control for marital status and for health. So if your marital status doesn't change, and if you stay healthy, you can look forward to ongoing improvements in your well-being. It becomes shallower towards the end. And then I put in social support, and that again doesn't change it uh, very much, um, the shape of the line. So the key drivers here appear to be marital status and health for the, deter for the deterioration in later life. I'm of course not explaining, this isn't a flat line, a horizontal line. I'm not explaining the improvement um, uh, over time. What I am doing is explaining the tail. And you see something very similar for the life satisfaction measure, which is not surprising because the basic pattern is the same for the life satisfaction measure. And so I bolded the lines that do the explanatory work here, and as you can see, they're the marital status line and the health line. So the marital status line kind of flattens it a bit towards the end, and then once you take into account health changes in later life, you see continual improvements in um, life satisfaction across age cohorts. Not quite the same. Um, uh, for the quality of life measure, the eudaimonic um, measure, which as I showed earlier, deteriorates with age in a, in a 
in just an age and ethnicity adjusted model. And the only bold line here that I've got is health. So marital status actually makes no difference to the shape of the line. Socioeconomic position makes no difference to the shape of the line, and social support makes no difference to the shape of the line. Um, just health, and the drop in later life becomes smaller once you take into account the poorer health of older people compared with younger people. It's still there, but it is explained to a certain extent. And, to cer uh, and, and also, I, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, it's, I don't think it's entirely surprising that different explanatory factors work for this kind of measure compared with the um, life satisfaction and um, depression symptomatology measures. But perhaps a crucial thing around um, autonomy, uh, self-realization, and so on, is how healthy you are. Okay, the next thing I want to do is to look at aging effects as well as age cohort effects. And so this is the full result from the um, uh, uh, multi-level uh, growth model. And I'm just looking at life satisfaction here. So the improvement with life, you can see the on average improvement with life satisfaction across cohorts and then the deterioration. But what each of these lines show is the, traject is the trajectory as people grow older. And so the lines represent wave on wave change um, in um, life satisfaction and wave on wave change for different age cohorts. So, so we haven't imposed a uniform change. What you can see is that in earlier um, age groups, an improvement in life satisfaction. So the lines are beginning to point upwards a bit. And then as you get to mid to late 50s, it kind of becomes horizontal and then the lines start pointing down. So you see the deterioration in life satisfaction as people grow older uh, for later cohorts. And that becomes really quite steep uh, in, in later life. And the question, and this is a partial model, so this just has age and gender, uh, sorry, age and gender, this just has gender and ethnicity um, in it. Um, uh, and the question is whether the kind of variables I've used to, ex to explain the deterioration in life satisfaction in later life also explain the within-person trajectories, the on average within-person trajectories and how they vary across age cohorts. And the answer is not to a great deal. So, I put the controls in, the purple lines here, uh, and what that shows is the improvement in life satisfaction on average with age, across age cohorts, um, as um, you would expect. And the lines are pointing upwards for quite a long time now. So the within person change across ways of observation continue to improve until about the age of 70, well, sorry, I should look at the starting points, so until about the age of 60, 65, then they level out and then they begin to deteriorate. So the model explains some of the difference across age cohorts and deterioration with age, but by no means all. So the lines at the end aren't as steep as, um, the, in the purple bars as they are in the blue bars, but they're still going downwards. So cohort is in effect age. So each of the, yeah, so, so the, the labeling is a bit awkward. So each of these lines represents one cohort. And so the on average cohort effect you can see by thinking about the middle of those, uh, of those graphs. And then the within cohort change is represented by the line. So that's the wave on wave, the time effect. And we've allowed that slope to vary, of course, as you can see uh, across different age cohorts. Okay, so, so pretty, at an earlier point, I, may, I, I also kind of made the point that this shape isn't really affected by socioeconomic position. But that doesn't mean that socioeconomic position isn't important for well-being in later life. And that's what this slide um, attempts to show. So I've, we've, I've graphed the results for each wealth quintile. Uh, this is pretty much an unadjusted model, just gender and ethnicity in the model. Uh, and then stratified by wealth across five wealth quintiles. And you can see that for each wealth quintile, the shape is pretty much the same, and that's not surprising because wealth doesn't make much difference uh, to the model, to the shape of the line when I adjust for it. But when I stratify for it, you can see that each of these lines are neatly stacked one above the other. Poorer people have much higher rates of 
depression symptomatology than richer people, and that exists across the life course, across these age cohorts. And you can, although, and although it's reduced at the end um, to a certain extent, you can see it persisting um, across. So money matters in terms of well-being. Um, money is associated with well-being uh, throughout, uh, across these age cohorts. <coughs> The other things that make a difference, um, uh, as, as I discussed, were, were things like health and marital status. And of course, health and marital status are not randomly distributed across the population either. Uh, they're deeply stratified by class, by socioeconomic position. So the chances of your health getting worse in your later life are strongly correlated with your socioeconomic position. Hence, perhaps, the stacking that you see there. And this exists both in younger old people and in older old people. So this is a very simple tabulation. Uh, stratified men and women and stratified age groups, 50 to 59 year olds and 75 pluses. And then each group showing the levels of self-reported fair or poor health um, by wealth. Five wealth bands, uh, five wealth quintiles. And you can see each is very steep. Regardless of age and regardless of gender, you can see this marked deterioration in health across wealth groups. Mark difference in health across wealth groups. It becomes really stark when you draw a few circles uh, on the graph. This 75 plus age group compared to this 50 to 59 year old age group and the same here. You can see that the richer older people have the same kind of health profile as the poorer younger people. So a 75-plus-year-old woman in the second richest wealth quintile has the same health as a 50 to 59-year-old woman, on average, 50 to 59-year-old woman in the second poorest quintile. And I think these are really stark, descriptive, entirely descriptive, but these are really stark differences. Also descriptive is this. This shows survival rates over a six-year period, I think, um, for people aged 50 plus, stratified by wealth, nothing fancy in these models either. And you can see that for women, the richest fifth, only something like three to four percent of them have died over this six-year period, compared with more than 15 percent of the poorest fifth. And you can see the same for men. Mortality rates are, of course, a bit higher for the men but you're looking at figures comparing 6 or 7% with almost 20%. One of the other kind of interesting things to think about is, is how fixed these class differences are in terms of questions of social mobility. So what, what, one of the kind of claims we have of um, uh, our economies, and particularly how our economies have changed over time, um, access to education and so on, is that we've seen great mobility. So these perhaps reflect people's life chances as structured um, by their resources rather than by their class position. And I'm now going to show you a table that I, obviously I've set it up. I'm going to show you a table that's going to attempt to dissuade you of that. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. This is a different table. I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. It just shows the unequal distribution of wealth across the population, of course. Something that we know very well. Um, I'd forgotten I had this slide in here. Um, so almost just over 40% of the population in a survey. So this is a population in a survey. Um, almost 40% of wealth is owned by the top 10, just over 40%, sorry, and by the top 10%, two-thirds by the top 20%, uh, and three-quarters, I think that adds up to owned by the top 30%, with the bottom 40%, 50% perhaps owning almost no um, uh, wealth, financial wealth. These are people who answer a survey. So I argue by implication that this difference would be much starker if we included the total population. This is the table I was talking about around social mobility. If you ignore the female figures for, the minute, for, for a minute and just focus on the class of origin figures um, to start off with, what I have here is different um, age cohorts, very simply stratified into 10-year bands, with the top band being a bit less than 10 years, 
and the bottom band being a bit bigger. And that, and that, and that just reflects the um, composition of the ELSA population. So year of birth, and then class of origin, so this is their father's class, or the chief wage earner in their households when they were a child's class. And then their relative odds to be in a managerial class themselves, a professional or a managerial class themselves, with the odds set in comparison with the semi-unskilled manual group. Of course, the higher the number, the more likely you are to end up in a professional or um, uh, managerial class. And the interesting thing to do is to look across rows and to see that the figures don't shift dramatically. The class advantage that you get from your class of origin in the very early cohorts persists for the more recent cohorts. We haven't seen any rapid shifts in social mobility um, chances in comparison uh, across class groups. And that doesn't mean that things don't change, of course. They do. They change quite dramatically. And that's the reason why I put the female row in there. So this is women compared with men. And you can see that for women compared with men, although there's still marked inequality uh, for the youngest cohort, um, a relative chance of only two-thirds of that for a man to end up in a professional or managerial class, there has been a dramatic improvement across these cohorts from a third to two-thirds of the male chance. So there is space for social change. It just hasn't happened. Of course, social mobility may not be the answer to the problems that we face, but um, nevertheless. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap up um, now and just make some concluding um, uh, comments um, and try and bring together um, uh, the things that I've um, uh, been saying. So the first thing to say is that we can conceptualise and measure well-being in different ways, and I've offered you one route to um, uh, doing that. Uh, and if you do that, then you see slightly different effects or maybe really different effects across different types of measures and particularly a difference between the more hedonic type measures, which are about maximization of pleasure, and the eudaimonic, which are about self-fulfillment. And so you see the U-shaped relationship for the hedonic measures, and you can see that that's largely explained by experiences that people have in later life. And once we take account of those, we see improvements uh, in um, life satisfaction and in depressive symptomatology um, across um, age cohorts. But we don't quite see that for the measure of um, uh, eudaimonic uh, well-being as measured through the CASP. The deterioration with age persists regardless of the controls, uh, though it is diminished to a large extent in the fully adjusted models. The second thing to say is that growing older the, and the effect of growing older varies across cohorts. So you saw the improvements in life satisfaction for younger cohorts and the rapid de deterioration for older cohorts. And although th that contrast was diminished again by the inclu inclusion of um, uh, various explanatory variables, it was still present um, uh, in, in the fully adjusted model. And so the question then is, in these fully adjusted models, we seem to be doing quite well in terms of explaining age cohort differences. Uh, but we're not really explaining the experience of time, the experience of aging, um, very well. And we've included here three possible reasons why we're not explaining aging um, experiences, time experiences, very well. And one is the possibility that in repeated measures, you're conditioning people um, uh, to the measure. There may be ceiling and floor effects and so on in the kinds of measures we use. Importantly, there might be real cohort differences. Uh, and we need more data, more time to begin to try and unpick whether there are real cohort differences. But also important, and I think this is important, this is the problem of using survey data, of course, is, is that you don't capture people's experiences fully. So even in a study like ELSA, which is interdisciplinary, multidimensional, includes many measures of people's experience in later lives, there are many things that we don't measure. Some of them we could account for in these kind of models. So things like spouse's health, we could take account of in these models. But other things like seeing your friends become ill and die, we can't take account of. The sense, the realization um, uh, that your life is moving towards an end and so on. Those kind of things we can't really account for in these models. And then the final point, and this is a really important point that I want to make in terms of the context of um, uh, 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 a paper on inequality is that the things that we adjust for in the model are not randomly distributed across the population. And I tried to illustrate that. So the chance of your spouse dying is not randomly distributed across the population. 
The chance of you becoming ill is not randomly distributed across the population. So not only is well-being stratified quite starkly by um, uh, wealth, by socioeconomic position, the things that explain the shape are also very stratified um, by socioeconomic position. So, if we think about well-being in later life, we have to think about the relationship between age and transitions. And I've listed the few that uh, are important, even if they don't all explain a wealth pattern. They're all important in terms of determining uh, well-being. So marital status, health and disability, people's wealth, and people's retirement status. But these transitions, as I say, I'll say it again, are not randomly distributed across, across the population. They're structured by social class. The other thing I want to say, and, and I touched on it in the, in, in the ways in which those um, lines change across different um, age cohorts, is that there are important cohort generation and period um, effects happening here. So the shifts in occupational structures over time, though I've also shown you some evidence that that hasn't really related to differential chance of, a change in differential chance of um, uh, mobility. The change in pension arrangements over time, and we're seeing that particularly starkly now, the ways in which our, our, our pensions are, are being transformed over time. Um, and when I was listening to Claire talk, it occurred to me, of course, it's completely obvious that women and women's pension arrangements are being sacrificed particularly um, in, in the current period in response to an aging population that's particularly harm public sector pensions. Um, the ways in which retirement choices are happening, of course, is changing over time. Marriage choices, so I, I do indicate up there that divorce is important, but of course the meaning of divorce transforms across these um, cohorts and generations and is worth exploring. And then of course the point that I keep making, uh, persistent inequalities. So this is my final slide. Uh, you can see a long list of colleagues who've contributed to a large extent um, uh, to um, uh, the paper I've just presented. And the core of the paper you can find in a paper that's first authored by Stephen Jivraj, the person at the top there, but also involves Bram Van Hoot and uh, Tarani uh, Chandola, as well as uh, me. Thank you very much. Thank you.